Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us on this fifth of six webinars that we will be featuring here at the National Museum of the Pacific War throughout the year in celebration of the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. I'm Jeff Copsetta, and we have a plethora of folks that are joining us here today, an entire panel uh, that will be talking about the terrible end, the Battle of Okinawa, the final battle and the bloodiest battle in the Pacific during World War II. Joining us today is Mr. John C. McManus, professor at Missouri Science and Technology and a very distinguished author. And we will be also be joined by some curators and archivists at other museums and libraries around the country. So without further ado, Mr. McManus, we're gonna turn it over to you. Thank you for joining us and uh, welcome. Great, thanks for having me. Um, what I wanna do is get, just give a little overview of the battle and maybe just a little bit of the, the flavor of what it was like, why it was fought, um, you know, just some of the larger consequences of the battle. Um, if we could, I, I had a, a, just a, a very small PowerPoint with, uh, with a few maps, and I, I love using maps because I think, uh, especially for any battle, it really helps us visualize, um, you know, where these places are, um, you know, which units are involved, that kind of thing. So if we could go to the, the uh, first slide, please. It should show, I don't see it right here, but it, it uh, should show that uh, um, you can see, there we go. Um, you can see the state of the, the American slash allied advance towards Japan as of the early months of 1945. And so what's happened by then, obviously the, the tide of the war has turned you know, immeasurably against Japan. Um, and it's, it's well to realize that probably something in the order still about 40 to 50% of Japan's land power is still tied down on, uh, in China. Uh, and obviously that's important because for every soldier who's involved in China, they, they can't be in the way of the Americans as they're advancing towards Japan. Um, you've had in the meantime, a kind of a dual advance across the Pacific uh, by the Americans and also the Australians. Uh, MacArthur's Southwest Pacific area has capstoned in the Philippines, which of course is MacArthur's vision. And at this very same time, in those early months of 1945, heavy fighting was going on um, on the island of Luzon, which of course is the, the largest and the main island in the Philippines, but also in uh, the southern and central portions of the archipelago. Lieutenant General Robert Eichelberger um, is conducting an incredible lightning campaign to liberate various islands of the, the uh, Philippines. So as that's happening, the other sort of prong of the American advance was uh, there in the central Pacific. It had this island hopping campaign and the Americans then were in a position to take Iwo Jima, uh, which, of course, is one of the worst battles of World War II um, from February to, uh, to March 1945. And the purpose behind that one is to, to capture landing fields and to, to have a smoother uh, kind of bombing corridor from American B-29 bases in the Marianas in the heart of the Central Pacific, obviously, to the Japanese home islands. And so those bombing raids were, were ongoing and they were about to get very, very serious with the fire bombing raids of Tokyo as of March 1945 and, and thereafter. So in the meantime, Admiral Chester Nimitz, uh, sort of the other prong of the Pacific besides MacArthur, um, you know, in, in sort of culminating his operations uh, to, to prepare for the invasion of Japan, uh, must have the Ryukus, uh, and you can see them right there at the doorstep of the Japanese home islands, and most notably Okinawa, which is the largest of all the islands in the island chain, a, a kind of lobster claw um, shape to this island, uh, and, and a, you know, an enormous island that must be taken if you are going to move on to, to Japan. So that gives you a kind of a, a broader sense of the where and why. So Okinawa simply had to be taken, as did many of the smaller islands around it, uh, so we can move on to the next slide, please. Okay, there you see on the right, um, the Japanese defenses for Okinawa, and you're looking at the island, you can see a little bit of the, the uh, smaller islands around it that the Americans will generally take in order to have uh, artillery platforms and um, um, even like little seaports to, with, with smaller boats that'll patrol the coast and, and uh, you know, things of that nature. But uh, the, the Japanese, of course, are defending this place pretty heavily. Uh, Okinawa, by 1945, 
had been melded into uh, Japan itself. It had prefecture status, which meant that it was part of the, the, uh, the country. Uh, but Okinawans were not viewed by everyday mainstream Japanese who come from the main home islands as completely Japanese and completely equal. But nonetheless, they were part of the empire and had, citi had citizenship status. So uh, you have Okinawan militia who are going to defend the island, and then you have about 77,000 plus Imperial Japanese Army soldiers. Uh, so in, in total, you've got about something in the order of 100 to 110,000 uh, armed enemy soldiers, whether Okinawan militia or Imperial Japanese Army. One thing that, uh, that really stands out uh, for the, the Battle of Okinawa versus many others throughout the Pacific War is the size and quantity of artillery that the Japanese have, much, much more so than in most any other battle, um, excepting maybe China. Uh, so when you're talking about the Americans clashing with the Japanese, one advantage the Americans always had throughout really even the beginning of the Pacific War, believe it or not, was a, a larger quantity of artillery and better artillery. And that was not always true at Okinawa. The Japanese, in some places, sometimes had some level of equality, though the, the Americans certainly always had more firepower. So uh, to invade Okinawa, uh, what was called Operation Iceberg, uh, Nimitz has compiled massive forces that are going to be under his command. Uh, 1,300 uh, ships are going to comprise this armada. When you talk about, uh, you know, the, uh, um, the size of the United States Navy forces involved, Okinawa is arguably the greatest battle in the history of the United States Navy. Uh, there's greater naval participation in this battle uh, than there is in, in the Normandy invasion from an American viewpoint. Um, I should also add there was a British fleet added to Admiral Spruance's 5th Fleet. Uh, Admiral Raymond Spruance was the overall tactical naval commander on scene. Um, so you have a British fleet that also included aircraft carriers. Uh, so in tandem, this Allied fleet had 18 battleships, 40 aircraft carriers of varying sizes, um, and as I said, about 1,300 vessels. Um, you can see you're going to have uh, a pretty major land component that's going to invade in the central neck of the island there. Right there you can see that, that kind of lobster claw shape and you can see the, the American plan is to invade right at the central portion of the island and then fan out in either direction. So we've got four divisions, and that, of course, requires a lot of shipping. That's, a, that's more um, ground combat divisions than we had um, uh, on Dia in, uh, in Normandy, believe it or not. So this is a major operation. Um, the 3rd Marine Amphibious Corps consists of the 1st and 6th Marine Divisions. 1st Marine Division, of course, uh, had seen a lot of action in the Pacific, most famously at Guadalcanal and at Peleliu. Uh, 6th Marine Division was new, uh, but it was under the command of a future commandant of the Marine Corps, if you're interested in the history of the Corps. This man's name is Lemuel Shepard. He had performed very well at Guam as a brigade commander. Now he gets a division of his own. The Army contingent is under 24th Corps, under uh, Lieutenant General John Hodge, who had earned his stripes in the, in the Pacific, and uh, excuse me, in the Philippines and in the South Pacific. And he's got the uh, 7th Infantry Division, which has seen a lot of action in this war, starting with the invasion of Atsu in 1943. But it had also fought in the Philippines, it had fought at Kwajalein, and the 96th Infantry Division, which had fought at Leyte in the Philippines. Um, you have follow-on forces, Army forces, the uh, two National Guard units from New York, the 27th and 77th Divisions, both of which had seen quite a lot of combat action. So these are, um, these are very, very well-trained, well-armed units. Uh, you can also see at the bottom of the map there, just on the, off the southern coast, um, off the southern coast of, uh, of Okinawa, you can see there's a, a faint invasion by the 2nd Marine Division. Um, so uh, what's the Japanese plan to try and, and stop this invasion? Are they going to try and stop them at the waterline? The answer is no. The Japanese, uh, the smartest of their commanders, have figured out by now that really once you lose control of the air and the sea, which they largely have, especially at this point in the war, your opponents um, are probably going to get ashore in an amphibious invasion. Uh, so the Japanese had begun to, to uh, uh, reorient towards inland defense. Now you'd seen this most famously, of course, at Peleliu. Uh, you had seen it in the Philippines. Uh, you're going to see it um, at, at Iwo Jima to some extent, and you're going to see it at Okinawa. The Japanese commander, General Ushijima, uh, really fortifies the southern part of the island, the, the most heavily populated part of, of uh, Okinawa, and that kind of central neck there, which you can see from, from Naha to Yonabaru. Uh, he's going to have a very solid line of defenses there, what's called the Shuri Castle area. 
Uh, he's going to have dug in a lot of uh, troops and a lot of uh, artillery pieces. There's a lot of caves there. It's good defensible ground. Now, there are some Japanese in the north, but they're not going to contest uh, the initial American invasion. Um, so the invasion, what's known as L Day, is April 1st, 1945. Interesting thing about April 1st, it was, of course, April Fool's Day, but it was also Easter Sunday. Uh, so a lot of the, the troops who are about to go ashore are wondering what's going to prevail, um, faith or absurdity. And in some ways it was both because the invasion is largely unopposed, uh, even though there was a massive uh, uh, American pre-invasion bombardment. I should also point out that uh, um, the Americans had already invaded some of the smaller islands nearby. Uh, they had been raiding Okinawa for months. Um, so the American presence was not really new. Uh, but, of course, this was the main invasion, quite obviously, on April 1st. And the other interesting thing, too, uh, General Ushijima and his staff uh, were at a vantage point where they could actually watch the American troops come ashore. And they're watching this through their, their field glasses, and one of the staffers uh, noticed that the, the Americans were chewing. A lot of the American troops were chewing as they came ashore, and he, he said to another staffer, he said, why would they be eating when they come ashore? And the other guy looked at him and said, have you ever heard of chewing gum? Uh, the, the first guy had never heard of chewing gum, and he had no concept that American soldiers would be chewing gum as they came ashore. So they got ashore no problem. The two Marine divisions then moved north uh, against, you know, they, they have some sharp fights here and there, but largely they clear out the island without the kind of opposition they expected. The two Army divisions turned south, uh, and make pretty good headway to get across the island, cut it in two within uh, about four or five days or so. And then they turn south, and of course, when they really run into trouble, it's around the Shuri area where Ushijima has placed his main defenses. At the same time, too, the Imperial Navy is going to react to this invasion, and this is what makes Okinawa um, the deadliest battle in the history of the United States Navy, just by a little bit over Guadalcanal. Um, and, and really, in some ways, the largest battle in the history of the United States Navy, and one that is a real point of crisis at times. Um, the Japanese are going to launch uh, suicide, um, basically suicide bombers. They're going to try that with ships. They're going to try that with uh, people riding torpedoes. But really, the most successful is the kamikazes, the famous kamikazes. Were they new? No. Um, the Japanese had already done this in the Philippines. Uh, with varying levels of success, but it was, a, it was a terrifying and horrifying weapon. They had run out of planes um, in the Philippines with which to oppose MacArthur's uh, invasions from Luzon and after, but they had hoarded them just specifically to use at Okinawa. So all of a sudden, here come these waves of kamikazes at the United States fleet. Um, and I think it's, it's very important to study this because it's a cautionary tale, and a little bit of a harbinger for the future, of the, the horrifying and terrifying effectiveness of suicide bombers, uh, that there's really never been any uh, defense created that can prevent them 100%. And in this case, the Americans are shooting down through combat air patrol and anti-aircraft um, about four out of every five of the kamikaze attackers. But the damage that could be done by just one that gets through, one plane hitting a ship or whatever, was profound. Um, the worst day of these attacks was April 7th, 19, or excuse me, April 16th, 1945, when the Japanese managed to throw 900 kamikazes at the Allied fleet, and they sank six ships that day. Um, overall, they're going to sink 36 ships. Mainly, mainly the kamikazes were what sank those ships. Uh, they're going to uh, inflict untold damage on many, many dozens of others. Um, eventually, you know, the Spruance is going to adjust. He noticed that the, the uh, kamikaze attacks are coming at dawn and at dusk, so he, he steps up combat air patrol at that time. He moves destroyers out on radar picket duty, and that really was the most dangerous duty you could have as a sailor in the Battle of Okinawa, to be on destroyer picket duty, because the Japanese knew those were the early warning guys who were out there telling the rest of the fleet kamikazes were coming. Um, so, they get attacked like you wouldn't believe. It's, it's a, just a horrendous experience for these guys. And of course, the Americans have plenty of their own carrier air and also some land-based air that are attacking the Japanese fields from which the, the kamikazes came, in the, mainly in Formosa and Kyushu. Um, the kamikaze pilots themselves were generally young, uh, young men, some of them college students, and you know they weren't exactly eager to die, but this is what was expected of them. 
um, you know, in a kind of cultural peer pressure in a way. And it was the same thing on land, too. Uh, as the battle steps up and gets worse on land, uh, the two army divisions, the, uh, uh, the 7th and the 96th, run into horrendous opposition around Shuri. Um, the 1st Marine Division will join them, as will elements of the 6th Marine Division. By now, you're also going to eventually have the 77th Division come ashore, too. Um, you know, and so you end up with this kind of attrition struggle. And so if we could go to the, the, uh, the next slide, please. The, uh, the problem, you know, is, yeah, I mean, you can see, just, just look how crowded that is. And, um, you know, look how incremental the advance is. I mean, it's become like trench-style warfare. And so the, the thinking is, why don't we have an outflanking amphibious invasion? Why don't we hit in the, the, the kind of southeast of the island there, right where you'd seen the 2nd Marine Division faint, uh, you know, and fake an invasion on, uh, on Elda, April 1st, and perhaps unhinge the whole Shuri line that the Japanese have set up. Uh, and this, is, of course, remains a controversy to this day, whether the American commander, the 10th Army commander, which the two corps were subordinate, Lieutenant General Simon Bolivar Buckner, and by the way, he was a son of a Confederate general by the exact same name. Uh, Buckner considers the possibility of putting the 77th Division aboard some ships and send them in there, but he's concerned that they're going to be bracketed on the beach, that you have heavy Japanese artillery there that will uh, lead to serious problems for them and that you won't be able to supply them well. The 77th is under strength because it had to garrison other islands that had taken, most notably Aishima, where the famous war correspondent Ernie Pyle was killed, embedded with them. Um, the 77th commander was a really interesting guy. He was a guy named Andrew A.D. Bruce, and uh, he was really a kind of innovative and aggressive thinker. And as he had led the, the division in the Battle of Leyte, um, he himself, his division, had performed an outflank amphibious invasion there in a place called Ormoc. And by the way, that was, that was December 7, 1944, three years of the day after Pearl Harbor. Um, and at Ormoc, uh, you also see the first appearance of the kamikazes. Uh, so this was, you know, about five, six months before, and it worked like a, like a charm. Uh, so Bruce thought it could work again here at Okinawa. Buckner considers it and rejects it about the third week of April. They consider it again in May. And by that time, Hodge is on board with it, but, uh, but Buckner is never on board, so it never happens. And instead, he'll feed the 77th into the line, he'll feed the whole uh, Marine contingent in the line, and eventually the 27th too, and just kind of pull his way straight forward into the Shuri line. And so in May, um, the rains come, massive rains come, uh, mud, trench warfare, cave warfare, uh, people living in the, just, it, you know, with maggots and, and uh, death and rot. Civilians are caught in the middle. The population of the island is about 400,000 plus. And the Okinawans are either militia or they're caught in the middle or they've taken shelter in burial caves that are also fighting positions. Uh, so the Americans don't know the difference. You have refugees moving along the road and American aircraft are strafing them because they don't know if that's Japanese military or not. And the Japanese military sometimes intermix with them. The Japanese are using them as human shields. About 100,000 Okinawans are killed, mainly by U.S. firepower, during this battle. It's one of many tragedies of the battle. Uh, so it's really at the worst of it, I would say in about middle of May 1945, right about when the war in Europe ends, and a lot of the guys on the line in Okinawa hear about this, and they could hardly care less, because it meant nothing to them, given their circumstances. So... Okinawa becomes this kind of battle of attrition that the Americans will win in the end, but it just depends how bloody it's going to be. At the same time, you have tension between the Navy and the Army. Nimitz wants his ships out of the way of the kamikazes. Uh, the Army um, fights a combined arms, incremental kind of fire support uh, war. And that's the way you save lives and you expend firepower, not bodies. Um, so, you know, the, these two concepts will conflict. Uh, but in a way, the battle sort of has to be fought this way when you look at the terrain, and Nimitz will come to agree with this too once he gets on the ground and sees what's going on at Okinawa. So um, the battle spills over into, into June, uh, but by then the Shuri line has been broken. Uh, Ushijima has withdrawn to that, that lower third of the, the island, um, you know, where, where his last defenses are prepared, and the Americans just kind of follow and just batter away at him. One of the things that's unique about the, the Battle of Okinawa is both commanding generals are killed. 
Uh, Buckner is killed by a mortar shell on June 18th, 1945. Ushijima commits suicide four days later. Uh, interesting little thing about Ushijima's suicide. Um, the Americans, of course, were all the time hoping that Ushijima's headquarters and the garrison would surrender. And they gave a last surrender entreaty around the, the middle of June or so. And Ushijima uh, showed that to his staff, and they all just kind of laughed. Uh, and, and by the, the, the testimony of the survivors, because a few of his staffers did survive, um, the, the sort of mood of the laughter was like, you know, we fought these guys for three years, and they still don't get it. Uh, that we don't surrender, we commit suicide when the end has come. Uh, so the, the battle kind of just staggers out to this bloody sort of coda, this sort of end by the third week of June after Ushijima's death. By then, uh, the Japanese have lost about 110,000 killed in action. That includes Okinawan militia. 7,400 were taken prisoner, many of them Okinawan laborers. Um, the Americans have lost 12,000 killed. Um, including about 5,000 at sea. As I said, it's the deadliest battle in the history of the Navy. They, the Americans have lost 38,000 wounded and missing. Uh, so it's been a, a horrible, bloody battle and a kind of a preview of what invading Japan is going to be like in the view of many of the Americans, which is one of the things that, of course, leads um, to leads the, the idea of using the atomic bomb and using uh, air power to subdue Japan to be a more attractive ideal in the summer of 1944. I should also say too, um, that the Americans already begun firebombing. So in a way they already crossed that Rubicon of completely destroying Japanese cities. They just come up with a new weapon by August, 1945. So Okinawa becomes in, in the view of many, this kind of preview of hell of what the invasion of Japan would be like in retrospect, um, you know, it is the, the terrible climax of World War II. Uh, but I think really one of the major legacies of it is to show the, the really terrifying effectiveness of suicide bombers, uh, even against naval assets. So I will show up there and turn it over to those who have some neat things to show you. And, uh, and again, be glad to take uh, questions later on. Well, thank you very much, Mr. McManus. That was uh, an awful lot of information in a very short amount of time. So well, well done there. The, the maps were certainly certainly a help. Um, yeah, uh, like we mentioned before, uh, we're going to be taking questions here uh, towards the end of the uh, webinar. But feel free to use your chat feature now, and we'll, we'll try to get to them as many as we can. Uh, next, we want to introduce to you Mr. Jayon Connectman. Now, he is the Chief Archivist, U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center up there in Carlisle, PA. We may be experiencing some technical difficulties, so we're gonna to try to see if we can get uh, Mr. Connectmon uh, to connect with us. Are you there, sir? We'll give him just one more minute to see if we can uh, if we can speak with him up there in Carlisle, it's a little it's a little ways away from here. <laughs> okay, well, I, unfortunately, I don't know if we're going to be able to speak with him, but we're going to go to our next guest, Mr. James Brundage. Now, Mr. Brundage is a curator up there at the Pritzker Military Museum and Library up there in Chicago. Uh, Mr. Brundage, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Excellent. Great. And we can see you too. Uh, well, thanks for joining us. And uh, what, uh, what do you have uh, to show us today? Uh, thank you so much for having me, guys. And uh, today I'm going to show you a diary that we have uh, that belonged to PFC Samuel Gewertz, who is an anti-aircraft gunner aboard uh, USS Bunker Hill. Uh, this is one of two diaries that he donated to the museum in 2012, uh, highlighting his service aboard Bunker Hill from uh, March 1943 until uh, the end of the war. Um, and most notably, I'm going to talk a little bit about his experiences during the Battle of Okinawa. Um, Dizzy Gewertz joined the Marine Corps uh, in 1943 and uh, requested sea service, uh, was assigned to USS Bunker Hill after it returned uh, the first, from its first tour in the Pacific, and would go on to uh, document his actions and, and his role uh, aboard Bunker Hill as a gunner with uh, Battery 1 Gun 7 
which is on the starboard bow of Bunker Hill. And uh, he highlights um, the actions, uh, the role that he played uh, during the Marianas campaign, Peleliu, the Philippines, uh, the invasion of Iwo Jima, and then of course, uh, during the Battle of Okinawa. Um, on the battle, uh, during the Battle of Okinawa, Bunker Hill uh, not only participated uh, offshore, uh, helping the invasion uh, fleet, as well as um, he mentioned sailing back and forth off the coast of Japan um, between uh, Ulithi and uh, Kaishu. Um, he mentions uh, the sorties flown by the air crews of the Bunker Hill, uh, talks about uh, shooting down Japanese uh, kamikazes, uh, talks about the, the air crews up the Bunker Hill, uh, bad landings, uh, rescue operations that they had to undergo as well. Um, so it's a very complete diary. Uh, he goes into extreme detail about the events that he witnessed, um, but none more so than uh, the events of May 11, 1945. Uh, that's the day that uh, the Bunker Hill is hit with uh, two kamikazes. And uh, he actually talks about it at 10.15 that morning. Uh, he and several other Marines were actually uh, on the flight deck playing catch when they spotted the two uh, zeros approaching. They jumped for their gun, uh, attempted to start firing, uh, they weren't able to get off any shots before the first kamikaze dropped its 550-pound uh, uh, bomb and then subsequently crashed. Uh, they were able to get off uh, shots uh, and hit the second kamikaze, though it uh, also crashed into the Bunker Hill. Um, he uh, talks about the uh, devastation, the destruction uh, of helping with the rescue operations of his uh, fellow Marines, the fellow sailors aboard the Bunker Hill. And later in the day, he actually mentions going down below uh, in an attempt to uh, retrieve some of his belongings as well as his fellow Marines. Uh, he talks about the darkness, pitch black, the smoke. Uh, and by the time he is able to actually get into his birthing area, uh, he says everything is completely melted down. Um, and so he does mention the fact that he generally kept his diaries in his pocket. And so we're very fortunate that he actually um, had these on him uh, during that event and that um, we were able to have them today. Uh, I did want to just highlight a, a passage from the end of his diary. Uh, May 11th would be his final entry uh, in the diary, uh, the day it was hit. And he mentions, uh, I'll bring this book, which was in my pocket the entire day to a close. Though the story of the Bunker Hill is not over, for she'll return someday to battle fixed up and with a refilled crew. I feel fitting to bring the story of the ship to a close now because her challenging, proud spirit is dead. Not permanently dead, perhaps, but I don't think she'll ever bear men as enthusiastic as those who raised her from a child, as to speak, and those who brought her her fame and her excellent battle record. Um, so this is just a really intimate first-person look uh, into the Battle of Okinawa from the naval perspective and uh, uniquely from a Marine stationed aboard Bunker Hill. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Brunage. Yeah, that was it really corresponds well with uh, what Mr. McManus was saying, of course, with those famous kamikaze attacks. And yeah, what, what an artifact to have from the USS Bunker Hill. That, that is really outstanding. Um, we, we are getting a few questions coming in. If you could bear with us for a few more minutes, we do have a few other guests that we'd like to get to uh, before we turn it over. Um, right now, I'd like to introduce uh, two curators. Uh, with the Cushing Library at the Texas A&M, which is uh, Mr. Anton Duplessis and Ms. Sierra Ladisaw. Folks, uh, thanks for joining us from Aggieland right down the road. Thank you for, uh, for asking and we're, we're delighted to share. Great, great. Okay, if I could get screen sharing so that Sierra and I can tag team, that'd be awesome. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, sure. Give us just a minute here. <clears throat> okay. okay here. Can I lead off? Yes. Um, so I'll start with the traditional Aguilan greeting of howdy. Um, and Anton and I are going to talk a little bit about a large collection that we've recently acquired, of uh, um, international edition of news maps at Cushing Library. These are all a part of our Reagan military collection. Um, and so I joined as the map curator and Anton is actually the curator for the Reagan military collection. 
So I'm gonna start off by giving you kind of a quick history on what the news maps were because they were printed to fulfill a number of purposes. Um, so the official title for the series was News Maps for the Armed Forces, and they were a series of posters that were printed during World War II. Um, they were produced every week between April of 1942 until March of 1946. And then there were a handful that were printed after that 1946 date that were kind of a retrospective look back, um, pat on the back sort of piece. Um, and so when these were printed, they were posted at the American military installations around the world and also at our war production facilities. And they were actually produced in a number of sizes. The one you'll find most commonly were the poster size that was printed um, for the U.S. military bases and production facilities. Um, and these were actually the ones that were also distributed through the Federal Library Depository Program into library collections around the United States. And so these are at that larger size of what you would expect if you were to go to buy any sort of poster. Um, a smaller size was also produced, um, and these are the international editions. And as far as I'm aware, these international editions were not largely distributed through the FDLP uh, program. So if a library has them, they've acquired them through a different way. And these international editions, when they were printed, resembled and reused the content from the US editions, but they were not a direct reprinting and they were also printed at a much smaller size. Um, what made the international editions very interesting was they were not printed in one location. They were printed in the region they were intended for distribution for, which is where you would see some of that customization take place. Um, so for instance, the ones that were made to be distributed in India were printed in Calcutta, um, and the Egyptian editions were printed in Cairo. And when they would put, produce these, they were a resource for both your military members, but they were also a motivational tool from the U.S. government, targeting kind of all branches of who might work in uh, World War II. So the typical news map included a brief update of what was happening in that previous week, accompanied by one or more maps, photographs, and illustrations. And they also had a reverse side, which could be an additional map, more photographs, or information targeted at military service members. So stuff about the GI Bill, or how to send mail home, or reminding men in military not to spend all their money and send some back to their families. And something Anton and I have really discovered while working with these news maps, and we got them in a huge stack at auction, um, is that knowing what your edition is is really critical um, because these overseas editions are um, not quite as common as what we find in the US editions. In cataloging them, it makes a really interesting issue because the volume and issue numbers vary wildly. Um, and so what we have found in the collection we've acquired is that we have maps that were printed in Italy, the Africa Middle East uh, section, Panama, the Middle Pacific, China, Burma, India, and in the Persian Gulf Command. And so now I'll turn it over to Anton to actually talk about our specific maps that we've so far uncovered in processing the collection that deal with Okinawa. Thank you. So we've got three maps that we're going to highlight today, uh, and they give some, some snapshots, if you will, of uh, the invasion and the progress on the, during the battle. And uh, we begin off with the May 7, 1945 edition from Panama. And this one's interesting because it gives us volume three, but there's no number on it. And so trying to find who else may have this is very interesting because it's sort of incomplete. Uh, this piece is titled Germany Nears Collapse, but there's a progress in Pacific, which is down on this little left-hand side there. And the poll quote here is the 96th Infantry Division progressed to within 800 yards of Shiri, Okinawa's former capital, et cetera, et cetera. You know, you're getting a good sense here for who is involved and what the action is. Notice, of course, it's May 7th. This battle has been going since April 1st. And this is essentially a weak lag between production and the event. There's a inset here. And uh, what we've got is... Um, Okinawa battle rages, and there's a poll quote here about the planes of the U.S. Pacific Fleet continuing. And one of the things that's very interesting is, that, and I try to blow it up a little bit, so forgive the lack of clarity, is that you can very clearly see that line here um, that was referred to earlier by Dr. McManus about um, between Naha, Shiri, and Yanabaru. Um, it's clear that the American forces and Marines have taken the Northern Ireland and that this area right here is a source of resistance to the capture of the island. We're going to jump ahead to the next map, June 11th. This is the overseas edition, 
and Pacific Action Flares. And so I've reprinted essentially with a whole little text block there and it's focusing on a couple of the locations um, of action or destination in the case of Tokyo. And in the case of Okinawa, again, we're seeing this battle line here of the Shui defense, if you will, letting us know um, what's going on. So here we are a month later and there's barely any progress. Although you can see um, on the blow up right here on the left side that the conical hill has been taken. And so that line has been pushed past Yanebaru, allowing for that East Coast corridor that becomes very important to the um, taking of the island. At this time, we also know that um, the Marines are, start, are starting to really enter into Yaha. And then on um, the uh, July 3rd edition, this is from the Italian front, if you will, the Italian edition. And this page is called the Okinawa Campaign. And there's a huge amount of text here. And uh, they give a good description here. I'm going to move on with a couple of other pieces, uh, blobs of these materials. But interestingly, it shows the campaign badges or the insignia for the constituents of the 10th Army. Um, but given the role of the Navy, it's sort of, in a way, the Navy was a little bit slighted, I guess, in that respect. Um, so one of the things I find interesting about this particular one is that we've got a very good timeline of the battlefront as they occurred on this island. And you can see here in particular um, how you've got bear movement between 10, 17, uh, 10 April, if you will, and then 22 May, as this is a center of Japanese resistance using those escarpments, taking advantage of the geography there, and the ending on um, 21 June. But interestingly, when you take a look at the map, the yellow is very much variegated like this. And I'm almost wondering if they were trying to give an idea for the contours of the island, if you will, the topography. And then it shows the key importance for Okinawa um, and the distances. It put Tokyo clearly within easy range of bombers, um, a thousand mile flight, give or take, et cetera. And, um, illustrating the, the, the whole rationale why um, the Island Happen campaign mandated that Okinawa be taken. And so, as I said at the start, these are items we've recently acquired. And we do intend at some point in the future to have these digitized and available online. Um, before I can do that, I have to get them fully cataloged so that we can convert those records to the metadata to support having them online. Because these are the international editions, what we're finding is for the ones that have been cataloged at that item level with the really re rich details, is that that really only exists for the U.S. editions. And even then, that's pretty scarce. Most institutions that have these just say, we have 22 copies in a box, and they don't even tell you which copies they have. So it's great that they're preserved and in collections somewhere. But knowing that such and such library has 22 news maps when they were published once every week and then in various editions around the world is not that helpful to a researcher. So once I have these fully cataloged, they can start going through our process to become part of our digital collections. And that is what we have. Excellent, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Duplessis and Ms. Ladisal. Uh, we've got uh, one more archivist joining us, and it's none other than my colleague here at the National Museum of the Pacific War, uh, Mr. Chris McDougall. Uh, Chris, are you there, and what do you have to show for us today? Okay, there we go. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, um, today I have a really unique uh, document that uh, came to our uh, archives in 2004. Uh, it was donated by a uh, retired Army General in San, San Antonio. Uh, this is, uh, if you go back one slide, a couple slides. Um, this is the tentative operations plan for Operation Iceberg. Um, and this particular copy uh, in a couple locations here on the cover 
um, it indicates that uh, belong to the chief of staff. Uh, in the upper right, uh, there's the C and the S, and then very faintly below the, the uh, uh, operations plan, um, it, it's in pencil, it says uh, chief of staff. Um, the next several slides, next six slides, I'm just showing some uh, samples from the interior. Um, as the title indicates, uh, this was a living document of sorts uh, that laid out in detail all aspects of the operation and its moving parts. Uh, it's very comprehensive. Uh, it's roughly 500 pages. Um, and in several points, um, they have uh, taped over uh, addendums, changes, uh, underlying different places uh, of importance. Um, the earliest date that I found on the document is uh, 6 January of 1945 when it was released. And the, uh, the final date, the latest date that I, I could find on it uh, is from uh, one week after the uh, invasion started. Um, and at that point, it was downgraded from top secret to secret. Um, I've only run across one other similar copy um, of this document, and that was specifically made for the 1st Marine Division. And uh, it was released the same day, but has none of the addendums or markings found in this document. Uh, as I stated, uh, the uh, document came to us in 2004. I really don't have much provenance other than that. I don't know how this person uh, came to have it, but it, it's very fascinating. It's very comprehensive. Uh, to me, it uh, indicates how much information was gathered in advance. And uh, considering the, the 10th Army was uh, both Marine and Army, um, how large that force was um, in the invasion. Um, and that's, that's what I've got to share. It's, it's a very fascinating document. I'm sure that historians would love to have a look at it. Uh, thanks, Chris, for sharing that one. That's yeah, one of many really unique artifacts that we have here at the National Museum of the Pacific War. And you know, I appreciate you pointing out this, this, the size, the, the vastness, uh, and that's like what Mr. McManus said before, to think that this operation, less than 12 months after D-Day, ended up being a larger invasion. It's just a testament to what we could do in such a short amount of time uh, to put those many resources together. So really, really interesting there. Uh, so for right now, what we're going to do, we're just going to unmute all of our panelists here. And if just a little discussion board between you guys, if there's anything that you have for Mr. McManus, of course, vice versa, if there's anything that he has, uh, we're going to go ahead and open that now as we start gathering our questions. And we're going to get to some of those questions here uh, in just a few minutes. Oh. Mr. McManus is still muted. There we go. This pertains to what Chris just showed us. Um, the Chief of Staff of the 10th Army was a Brigadier General in E.D. Post. And so his job is basically to be the mastermind and clearinghouse for just reams of plans that he's getting from the operations section uh, from the various divisions and, and, and core levels that were under 10th Army at that point in time. So uh, it's really interesting to me to hear that um, his version of the plan was evolving and that, that makes total sense. He and Buckner would have been intimately um, discussing every element of that plan as you got close to L day and then sort of comparing what they had planned versus how it was unfolding. Chris had mentioned, I guess the last day was April 7th, if I remember it correctly. Yes. Um, you know, again, he would have seen, okay, how's the plan evolving and what does that mean for what we're going to do next? Uh, Post and Buckner had a, had a very solid relationship as a commander and chief of staff really must. Um, and so you can imagine how devastated Post was when, when uh, Buckner was killed on June 18th. I believe he was there um, in a group of officers with him, but I'm not certain about that. Anybody have anything else from our panelists for, for Mr. McManus? I would be just 
not necessarily a question, but just kind of comment based on, you know, the various objects we saw today, would be very interested to see the material like the diary and the planning documents and the spaces and places that are mentioned within them mapped to seeing that really happening in the point by point and with the time flow. Um, there's a lot to really communicate as to what's happening in the place it is and the time it's happening. I think that would just be a really interesting sort of exhibit that could be done with these sort of materials. Absolutely. Well, we're going to go ahead and take one of our first questions that came on board and it happens to do with the flamethrower. This one's going to be for Mr. McManus. Uh, in your opinion, in your research, how or were they effective in some of those Japanese emplacements that the, that the Marines and the Army ran into on the, uh, during the Battle of Okinawa? By the time of Okinawa, the flamethrowers were pretty effective. Two years earlier or so, uh, or really even a year and a half earlier, not so much. They were ungainly. They couldn't carry that much fuel. Um, it, a lot of times it didn't work. Uh, but by this time, the, the Americans had really begun to emphasize the flamethrower because they had seen how important it was in, in multiple invasions and a lot of close combat. Uh, so any uh, rifle platoon, and, and at this point, probably any rifle squad, was going to have access to a flamethrower team, usually a two-man team uh, that was going to be there straight with the, the frontline troops. So, I mean, at this point, uh, from Buckner on down, the Americans are getting a good um, feel for how important combined arms warfare was and how much close combat there was. And so they needed close combat weaponry that was going to be very effective against caves, especially. Uh, so flamethrowers would have been a really prime example, and obviously it's a terrifying weapon to face as a defender, um, the problem by the time you get to May is how heavily it's raining. Uh, and so the, the sheer wetness can at times, you know, diminish the effectiveness of the flamethrower. So at that point, um, they're trying to use tanks in close support, but they're getting bogged down in the mud like you wouldn't believe. Um, and so they're, they're using self-propelled guns. They're using demolition teams in addition to the flamethrower. But, uh, yeah, the flamethrower operators were, were some of the most important people in any infantry unit by the Battle of Okinawa. Absolutely. Yeah, I find it interesting, you know, looking at some of the TONE from some of those units in Okinawa as opposed to, like you said, when they first really came out in, in uh, the Battle of Tarawa, uh, how many more flamethrowers were available. And that really shows how effective and important they really were to have uh, on the battlefield. Um, next question, um, Hacksaw Ridge, how accurate? <laughs> Speaking of flames, uh, too much in Hacksaw Ridge, in my opinion, though, though a fine film, and I, I bought it in a lot of ways. I just think the action has too much flame, too many people flying around and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I don't know that it was quite that, quite that quite characterized it, but I also do think uh, it was remarkable how they, they showed the terrain um, and how they showed the actions of Desmond Doss, who is a fascinating guy. One of the most interesting things I found in my research was some of the original documentation of what Doss did. And so this is before he's a legend and a Medal of Honor recipient. And they're just kind of mentioning, hey, this medic it was incredible. He evacuated these dozens of people. And I don't know how he did it. And it was like word spreading, you know. So I, I think overall, it's, it's a really well done movie in terms of conveying him and what happened and, and some of the nature of the fighting there. But also, it's, it, there's also a little bit of Hollywood, just in my opinion. Historians are no fun to ever watch movies with because we pick it apart, obviously. But I, I think maybe there was, there was a little like Hollywood excess in terms of some of the, the, the fighting. Well, sure. I, I think that, that, you know, that's the difference between a movie and a documentary. You know, there, there's right. a good bit of entertainment involved with, with education as well. Uh, so the next question we have here is kind of, it's kind of a twofold question. And it's really, uh, was there an alternative to attacking the island of Okinawa? And do, and you, do you think that Nemesis' strategy was, was sound? Uh, I do personally. Yeah, I think Okinawa simply had to be taken if you indeed were going on to Japan, which is what they thought at the time. I mean, they, uh, MacArthur's um, uh, staff is planning heavily for the, the next step of the invasion of Japan. Uh, the, the Army and the Navy had finally come to an accord as to what they were going to do in the invasion of Japan. The MacArthur would have control of all the army forces, Nimitz, the naval forces, and, and they had learned to work together and, and make nice, especially Nimitz. I think Nimitz was very, very tolerant of MacArthur's excesses, just my opinion. Um, so, yeah, I think by any measure, they simply had to have Okinawa based on what was happening at the time. And obviously the Japanese understood this too, and it's one of why it was so bad. But the other thing too, uh, something I really should have brought up earlier, uh, once an island is big enough, um, the operations on the island become almost analogous to, to continental littoral operations. 
um, in terms of the, the distances and size and, and uh, the nature of the ground fighting and the, the resupply effort. And Okinawa kind of borders on that. You'd seen that in Luzon already. You'd seen it at Mindanao. You'd seen it on New Guinea, the vast stretch of New Guinea. And, uh, and I think Okinawa highlights that a little bit too. Excellent, yeah. Uh, so this uh, next question is actually something that uh, Mr. Brunich uh, brought up as well with his artifact. Uh, what were the responsibilities of crew on capital ships during kamikaze attacks? Or, or were there certain, what was there a, a certain posture for, uh, to repel kamikaze attacks? Um, so uh, Mr. Gewertz mentions that they were, um, you know, at general quarters at their guns um, whenever they, whenever they have warning of kamikazes, um, as he was the gunner himself uh, on a 20 millimeter gun. And um, so their job was to spot the planes and, and shoot them down. At least that was uh, his role as a part of the Marine detachment aboard the Bunker Hill. Um, there were, I believe, seven divisions of gunners aboard Bunker Hill, uh, one of which was Marines, the rest were sailors. So um, they all had pretty much the same responsibility, spotting and um, um, yeah, anti-aircraft fire. Actually, anything added that, Mr. McManus? I know you mentioned very briefly about some of the picket lines that we would set up to just kind of help intercept the kamikazes. But was there anything you can add to that on these capital ships? I mean, absolutely. It's just, it's literally the term all hands on deck. Um, you need every possible gun to, and all the firepower you've got to take down those kamikazes. Uh, so if that means your marine contingent comes into play on a, you know, a 40 millimeter mount or something like that, absolutely. Um, so it, the other thing too is that they would have been trained, not just the Marines, but the sailors, obviously to have a, uh, a, a battle, a battle station, you know, so uh, they would have known exactly where to go once they heard, uh, you know, general quarters and, and whatever else. So it, it's kind of interesting from a Marine perspective. It's so the, the service aboard Bunker Hill would have been so dramatically different than if you were with the first or sixth Marine division ashore, uh, but maybe no less dangerous and, and just just so frightening uh the randomness of whether the, the kamikaze is going to hit your ship or not what you could or couldn't do about it, it was very difficult for people to cope with that absolutely yeah it was quite an effective weapon um how good uh, was u.s intelligence on the japanese deployment and strength on the island uh, you know intelligence is everything on the battlefield on okinawa how, how well uh, informed were we it's, uh, it's kind of amazing to me, as, m as much intel as we've got at our disposal at this point in time, uh, that we still don't quite get that, that Ushijima does not intend to defend at or near the beaches and waterline. Uh, that, that, to me, is the big intel misunderstanding, but I don't know that it really made a difference either way, except in how much ordinance they're throwing out there you know, to, to pave the way for the invasion on L Day. Um, they don't, I don't think they have as strong an appreciation of the, the Shuri defense line as maybe they might have, but I also think, what if they knew every nook and cranny? You, you know, you still had to go in and take it the way they, they ended up having to do. So I don't think the intelligence was really quite what it should have been, but, um, but I don't know they really had all that material uh, an effect on the battle. It was just my view. Almost anyway. Looks like we have time for a few more. Uh, next one coming in is, uh, let's see, what do we got here? Uh, how long were the USA plans to invade Japan by the time of Okinawa? If, I, if I'm reading that correctly, uh, we're, we're, we're expecting to, to attack mainland Japan prior to uh, the Battle of Okinawa. How long were those plans set, I guess, uh, for Operation Downfall, essentially? Yeah, um, you, have, you have two operations that are basically on the drawing board at this point in time. Uh, you have Operation Olympic, which is going to be an invasion of Kyushu in November 1945 to be carried out by General, uh, Lieutenant General Walter Kruger's 6th Army. And then you have uh, Operation Cornet, March 1946, in which you'll have General Eichelberger's 8th Army and then what they thought would be General Buckner's 10th Army, but by then uh, General Stilwell commanded it that we're gonna invade, you know, haunt you and, uh, you know, move to Tokyo and do whatever else. So by April 1st, 1945, you've got some pretty serious planning going on for Operation Olympic, um, especially at Sixth Army level and at MacArthur's headquarters level. You also, from a Naval perspective, have Nimitz lining up, um, you know, the, the, the fleet assets that he thinks he's gonna need for that 
in tandem with a major effort um, on the part of the United States Navy to, to begin bombing Japan itself, almost as a kind of shadow operation or competition with the Army Air Force's B-29 campaign. Outstanding. Uh, were the uh, were the Marines still using Navajo coat talkers in the Battle of Iwo Jima? Or I'm sorry, the Battle of uh, Okinawa? I believe so, yeah. But if someone else knows more, chime in. Well, the next one, I have, I do have a question that came in for, uh, for Chris McDougal here. Uh, so the, the document that you showed us, about how many copies do you, would you expect would have been uh, created of that, of that battle strategy that we have? Um, I can't say with uh, any degree of certainty, but very few. Like I said, the only other copy that I saw was uh, created specifically for the 1st Marine Div- Division. That's it. So just a small handful. Probably, yeah, I, I would say if I can chime in a little bit, um, you probably would have had somebody for one for each member of the staff at Army level, Corps level, and Division level. So you'd have a G1, who's your personnel, G2 is intelligence, G3 operations, G4 supply, and G5 civil affairs. So, and obviously then chief of staff and the, and the commander and probably the XO and, and whatever. So you'd have, yeah, not a lot, but you would, you would also account for them. They would, sometimes you'll, you'll notice on those uh, operational plans, you'll notice a, a little uh, um, box uh, that has a number. And so they want to know exactly how many copies are circulating. I'll just chime in on this too. I am speaking specifically for maps. I have a number of maps in the collection that are um, in these top secret various coatings. And a lot of them will actually have very specific information on them of when and how and who was supposed to destroy them. Um, And so that's kind of an interesting thing too, to look at and wonder how many of them were actually destroyed versus these ones that somehow ended up in a box in the back of a room at Texas (laughs) (laughs) A&M. Well, it looks like we got uh, one final question here. Uh, it's an interesting one. What do you think motivated the soldiers and the Marines when they realized how grim this battle was going to be, this, the, the slugfest that Okinawa really became to be? Um, what was their motivation? Um, I think it's to fight for one another. Um, I think that, uh, you know, mom and apple pie and all that goes out the door once we're all in the mud together and we're living with rats and maggots and once uh, our infantry unit has absorbed 100 to 150 percent casualties and it seems hopeless um you know i'm gonna do it because you're gonna do it and that's it um i think a corollary to this is hatred the incredible hatred on both sides uh, avenging your dead buddies and whatever else and also there's a mindset in the american especially at the combat forces at the infantry level both the corps and the army uh, of, of killing Japanese as a kind of means to winning the war. Um, and I, I, think, I really think personally that's a kind of foundation that you have later on, the idea of body count and all that. It is very, very important in the Pacific War, and especially at Okinawa. Uh, so I, I think that, just my opinion, I think that's a big part of motivation. Yeah, absolutely. I think fighting for the guy next to you is, is it's key to success on any battlefield. You're absolutely right, sir. Uh, well, I guess I think that's going to wrap it up for today's webinar. Again, a big thank you from all of us here at the National Museum of the Pacific War for all of our panelists who are with us today. And of course, all of you who are participating, uh, thank you for your time. And I want to remind you that to our next and final webinar in this webinar series uh, here at the National Museum of the Pacific War will take place about a month from now on July 15th at 1 p.m. Central Time. And we're going to have Ms. Rona Simmons here. She's going to talk about the other veterans of World War II, the stories from behind the front line. So again, thank you again, and we will see you next time.